Hey there, Mr. Dragon Slayer here, and I'm glad you could make it. I hope you're ready for another seven verse installment of chapter 15 out of the Great Book of Job. Eliphaz is still at it, his attacks on old Job, that is. And his attacks are getting more severe, devious, and carnally minded. His strategy definitely comes straight from the pit of hell, as he becomes a volunteer at being a useful tool of the devil. God has forbidden Satan from touching Job's soul, which is true for these devils. But that's not the case for Job's three friends, which have their free will and don't seem to mind being inspired and influenced at the present time by the wiles of Satan to touch the inmost parts of Job with slanders, lies, fears, doubts. A perfect storm, so to speak, for Job's mind and body to be afflicted through the established inroad of Eliphaz's friendship, by which the devil can use Eliphaz's sort of persecution and affliction upon Job's innocency. The whole objective for Satan is to get a conviction on Job, because if Satan doesn't get the conviction, Satan isn't going to get paid. No, in fact, they'll be accountable for the damages Job incurred. And at least double that, double for Job's trouble. Now please join me in saying a short prayer before we begin. Jesus, my Lord and Master, increase my aptitude and willingness to not go for the okie doke like Eliphaz, but rather cause my purposes to seek the truth accurately with a persistence and a tenacity that can only be achieved if I work as if it's unto the Lord. Amen. Now let's begin in the great book of Job, chapter 15, verses 15 through 21. Verse 15. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Eliphaz doesn't disappoint in his abilities to conjure up new charges of Job's guilt and reluctance to repent of his so-called grievous crimes against God and his fellow citizens. He also continues in a previous vein of imaginations found in Job 4.18. Eliphaz says, Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. The theme is the same though. God is so holy and undefiled that in comparison to anything else, it is impure, whether it's inhabited or living. This, according to Eliphaz, includes all the celestial beings, which he expresses are higher life forms than human beings. Job, we know, on the other hand, is not being sinful, as in relation to his sufferings, which is the constant generalized theme of the three friends. But rather, we know without a shadow of a doubt, Job is free from corruption, but not his imperfections. All in all, Job is suffering by Satan's malfeasances, which are corrupt and loaded with imperfections. One might very well consider how apt Eliphaz is to tune into hell's message and not tune into heaven's, while he sits there and assesses Job's circumstances. Unfortunately, the influence of Satan upon Eliphaz is reaching astronomical proportions, where later in this good book of Job, he might very well take the place of Job, and all that he has charged him with, and Job will take Eliphaz's assumed current position of righteousness and justification. Verse 16 How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water? There's not much that can be done for a defensive sinner who loves and adores their sins. It's like an alcoholic or drug addict who won't put down his drinks or drugs until he's made by the law in some sort of capacity, like getting locked up, getting divorced, going to a 12-step fellowship, losing their children, going to the mental ward, or some other excruciating punishments they'll endure to stay in their cups or with their drugs. 
To drive this point down, Eliphaz seeks to establish just how lawless and stained by corruption Job really is. The old philosophy of do right, get right rears its ugly head again, with Eliphaz referring to Job as desiring greed, lust, thefts, and covetousness, like a thirsty man panting for water in the hot desert. The evidence is clear enough to Eliphaz that Job is suffering for his defiant, unconfessed sins and iniquities. Verse 17 I will show thee, hear me, and that which I have seen I will declare. Eliphaz will not disappoint in declaring he's the fount of wisdom and that his traditions are the archetype of pure-blooded races. His pride is exalted before Job through his reasoning and logic of why sins so egregious as Job's demand strokes from God, casting the iniquity and hypocrisy at Job vehemently will in Eliphaz's mind declare the burden of proof to God's just verdicts and to Job's personal guilt and wrongdoings. Verse 18, which wise men have told from their fathers and have not hid it. Before books, there was a type of oral tradition passed on from the father to the sons and daughters. To conceal such things would be a type of violence and wickedness against the next generation. Unfortunately, in recent times, fathers, that is, if they're even present, have left their children in the hands of worldly teachers and worldly systems of education. Eliphaz is saying, Job, I'm going to reveal why your condition is a result of your transgressions through the words of the ancients whom testify to it to condemn the practices of the wicked. Like you, Job. Verse 19, Unto whom alone the earth was given, and no stranger passed among them. Once again, Eliphaz answers Job's reply in chapter 9, verse 24. Let's go there now. In chapter 9, verse 24, Job says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where? And who is he? It's pretty easy to understand Job's sentiment. That he was a perfect man in his seasons, shunning and abstaining from evil. Well, now it's as if the oppression and grieving comes from the ridicule and blind justice of the wicked throughout the land. Eliphaz's ire was kindled by Job's earlier statement. So to gainsay it, he says the races are undefiled and still dwell in their original regions unmolested. He takes Job's words to mean that he was saying the races were intermingling with one another and no longer pure, which Eliphaz takes as an affront, specifically with where he comes from, which is Teman, which nowadays is Arabia. Eliphaz is saying Job and Teman were so pure and free from any foreign ideas, so much as you won't find any traditions that haven't been passed down from our forefathers to our leading men and women. He's stating you won't find that we've been indoctrinated by any others, like what he considers foreign and inferior races, but rather they're taught by their own fellow countrymen who are righteous and wise. Just try to consider people weren't fond of outsiders because they knew they were likely spies amongst such as these. Spies usually find a great land and boom, they want to bring the rest of their kind or race with them to cohabitate and possibly take over the land for themselves, especially if where they come from is not prosperous and is desolate. Verse 20, The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. No one can feel the pain you experience. Therefore, Eliphaz is saying it doesn't go well with the wicked during their brief sojourn here on earth due to their being the author of their own misery and suffering. 
Just like a tornado comes out of nowhere, so to speak is the calamity that shall be the wicked person's undoing that Eliphaz is inferring of Job. Eliphaz suspects Job has thrown widows on the streets, moved land boundaries in his favor to steal and broke the arms of orphans figuratively by ripping them off and leaving them powerless to retaliate. Therefore, that's why suddenly Job has gotten his comeuppance for his scandalous oppressions. Eliphaz also is saying Job is hiddenly tormented by a guilty conscience, which he so grandiosely has covered over from sight by concealing his ever-present grievous secret sins. Verse 21, a dreadful sound in his ears. In prosperity, the destroyer shall come upon him. The Chaldee renders this verse 21 as, The fear of the terrors in Guyana are in his ears. When the righteous dwell in peace in eternal life, destruction comes upon him. Oh, what a portrait the righteous Eliphaz is painting of what happens to the wicked at the pinnacle of their prosperity. However, it may seem convenient to think along these lines. It says it rains on the just and the unjust. It's just way too superficial to look through Eliphaz's lenses of righteousness and unrighteousness, though. Taking an inventory of possible reasons for affliction is the better route to take. Like remembering our enemy Satan has their own sword to persecute and oppress the saints of God. Job is a perfect man who shuns and abstains from evil, yet he's being slain day and night. And it's not because he's a criminal, but because Job's a leading citizen in heaven is the reason for this devilish trial. The type of trial where Job's damned if he does, and damned if he doesn't. Really, one should be able to test the fruit of Job's ways to identify the reason for his suffering. See, Eliphaz is chock full of suspicion and false accusations. And that's the fruit of his ways, to just sling stones to see if he hits anything. That's not to say those who are truly wicked aren't going to hear some sort of dreadful news, like a visit from law enforcement, the IRS, or a bad report from the doctor, while they're living the high life. But in reality, a lot of times the wicked prosper right up until they die with a sudden heart attack and go straight to the abyss with their master. That's it for this message. I hope you learn it's not a great look for you to have the wrong notions and persuasions in your discernment toolbox. That is, of course, if you don't want to be some kind of erring spirit. Being right is about getting it right, so that goes without saying for Eliphaz. He's dead wrong and dead in his works concerning Job. I do consider if Eliphaz is so bad with his assessment of Job, what's the rest of his life like? I got a pretty good idea. He's what he professes to hate. So let him be a lesson for you and I to not play the hypocrite and practice what we preach against. Amen. Please join me in a prayer. Father Yahweh, thank you for all my blessings and giving me purpose. The enemies are chock full of resentment and their purposes are diametrically opposed to your will for my life and those you've entrusted to be under my care. I ask in Jesus' mighty name for you to confound, confuse, and destroy utterly their purposes. Thank you for having heard me. Amen and amen.